Hello, everybody. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. And our tracking of this shift in markets around Fed speculation for higher rates held for longer continues. A uh, bit of a uh, quiet response to, uh, today, a little bit more consolidative in the face of U.S. GDP data that was a little bit softer on the second revision from 2.9 to 2.7 percent. And that's very interesting because, of course, just earlier this week, we had a set of FOMC minutes that seemingly offered the markets a perspective of where they could choose their own adventure as it were. Um, we had the minutes say on the one hand, risks to growth are on the downside. It's a plausible situation that we may have a recession this year. That would, were it to have come out in December, in January, uh, encourage Mark to say, oh good, the Fed is not going to raise rates uh, for very much longer. They're about ready to stop. They might even be cutting at the end of this year. Let's go ahead and bake in almost 50 basis points in easing by the back half of 2023. That thinking has, of course, evolved significantly this month, because in those same minutes now released in February, the Fed said that uh, we still have a long ways to go in the inflation fight, that there was a meaningful contingent uh, on the FOMC that wanted a 50 basis point hike last time instead of the 25, and that the loosening of financial conditions uh, that has been characterized by stronger stocks and a weaker dollar uh, since essentially uh, late October, early November, and through to the beginning of this month when this thing turned, that this is an issue. That this is something that the Fed considers uh, counterproductive to its efforts to contain inflation. And so the markets could have chosen the risk on narrative. Indeed, for stock markets, certainly, there is a bias to choose the risk on narrative historically because most market participants are de facto long. The largest buyers of U.S. stocks pensions, endowments, they tend to never go short. They are long-term holders on the, on the long side. And so the market doesn't want to be biased down. It wants to be biased higher when you look at U.S. equities. And nevertheless, in those minutes, the markets found the bit that they could worry about and went that way. On the flip side, we have a GDP number today, which could have given a bit of reprieve to the bulls, could have said, oh, well, GDP is not as strong as we thought. Maybe the Fed might uh, curb its enthusiasm here a little bit. Well, not so much. That was largely ignored. And so we enter now into a really interesting space where we actually have meaningful data to finish out the week and we'll see what the reaction function is going to be. But clearly, the markets appear to have a degree of bias toward more of a worried stance on uh, where the Fed is going and what that means for risk sentiment, as opposed to a more sanguine perspective. So the thing that we are going to focus on today, and that which will finish out the week of uh, macro event risk uh, for us on the U.S. side, is going to be the Fed's favored inflation gauge, the PCE, the uh, Personal Consumption Expenditure Measure of Inflation. You have uh, expectations here on your screen. Uh, what you are looking at here is a meaningful rise of 0.5%, larger uh, significantly than the prior one of 0.1% uh, for the month-on-month -month reading. The year-on-year -year seen holding at 5%, the core seen cooling on the year-on-year -year figure from 4.4 to 4.3. So a bit of a mixed bag, but it's that month-on-month -month number that sticks out. And of course, we saw from CPI numbers for January 
that what we saw was a higher than expected number, but a bit more of a drift lower on the year on year figures, but a less of one than markets anticipated. So sort of a middle of the road kind of an outcome, neither here nor there. When we look at what's been happening with U.S. economic uh, data, uh, specifically in the inflation category, in the prices category, we can see that it has seemingly declined relative to forecasts. But that need not mean, actually, that the data itself has underperformed. What it might mean is that the forecasts have been adjusted. And so, interestingly, if you look at the core PCE year-on-year -year number itself, this is the um, actual um, expectation for that particular number, and of course the year-on-year -year, uh, core PCE inflation gauge, is what the Fed includes in its forecasting. This is really the key number that they're looking at. And we can see here that really since the first half of 2021, we have tended to outperform relative to baseline forecasts. Now, they have it hasn't been huge outperformance. Uh, we're talking about something that's perhaps on average 20 basis points, so not giant, but nevertheless, it has tended to surprise higher. And given how much markets are attuned into this Fed story, how sensitive they are to what's going on here, we may be looking at something that is um, going to give us a bit of a topside surprise on this key indicator. Looking at the overall dynamics, uh, this is something that a chart we keep going back to because, of course, it is so central to our narrative. The yellow bars that you see there are the two-year break-even rate. That's the difference between two-year nominal and inflation-adjusted bond yields. And when you take the difference, what it extracts for you is that magnitude of that inflation adjustment that gets you from nominal to real rates. And you can see now, for the month of February, that two-year break-even has cracked 3%. It is now significantly higher than it's been at any time, really, since late last year. And what this is telling you here, because you see uh, expectations running about two months ahead of CPI and PCE, so CPI there in the green, PCE in the red, and you can see there's a two-month lag on them. So I've pulled them back to line up with expectations, and you can see, indeed, the relationship is very clean. So the bottoms and the tops line up, and as expectations would have implied with about a two-month lead, headline numbers have come down. If this continues, because, of course, markets are forward-looking. It takes time to um, compile the headline data reports, and markets um, generally anticipate uh, terms uh, in the economy. They don't, um, they don't react once they've already occurred, so it makes sense that there's a lag. If this continues, then what we're looking at is a pickup in expectations that is likely to show up in baseline data. And that baseline data then is likely to find a degree of stabilizing. We saw it in CPI already. You can see there that 6.4 uh, number that we got most recently for January is looking uh, like the pace of decline has already started to slow. If we turn higher from here, well, then the Fed will have a much tougher job. So whatever we get on this number, as long as it isn't aggressively worse, than expected, as in aggressively lower than expected, then expectations would tell us that the path of travel for inflation in the coming months is higher, not lower, when you look at the official figures. And that is likely to encourage thinking that the Fed is going to have to do more. Now, why is inflation rising? Well, growth has looked better. 
And this is the great conundrum of the current environment, is that the markets clearly are caring more about the second round implications of that pickup in growth rather than just celebrating the growth itself. The focus clearly seems to be good economic data means more Fed tightening rather than good economic data means good economic data, risk on. So you can see here, since the start of the year, you've had better performance um, on both the manufacturing and the service sector, whether you look at it from the ISM PMI numbers or the S&P Global ones. We'll, we'll get the ISM update uh, for uh for uh, this month next week uh, we've already seen the ones uh, the preliminary set just earlier this week for the s p global numbers uh, and we can see here a number above 50 uh, in the logic of of pmis of course above 50 is growth below 50 is contraction the further you go above 50 the faster the, the growth and we're just a hair above it so we've essentially gotten to a neutral ish setting it would seem but that's after months of being sub-50. So we're looking at a situation where uh, we are not shrinking, not really growing with tremendous vigor, a little bit, but at least not shrinking for the first time since the middle of last year. A similar story um, in ISM numbers where we weren't quite so deep under 50, but nevertheless, there's been a, a pointed rebound in the pace of growth. Of course, much of the rejiggering of expectations that we've seen this month has followed from that very impressive non-farm payrolls report that we got at the beginning of this month, where you can see uh, job creation with 517 jobs added was way above expectations, more than double the baseline forecast, and the unemployment rate fell to a record low 3.4%. So again, signs of strength in the economy, but of course, that's inflationary. We'll get the final uh, revision of these consumer confidence numbers from the University of Michigan tomorrow. That doesn't tend to be a huge deviation from where they were un initially released. But the bottom line is there has been a pickup in consumer confidence as the Fed has successfully pushed down inflation here. So you can see over the period from about the middle of last year, inflation has declined. Over that same period, about the middle of last year, consumer confidence has improved. So there appears to be a clear reaction function here. And if you then consider what this means for the Fed, which is still looking at inflation well above its 2% objective, and inflation expectations that appear to suggest it's going to get away from that objective in the coming months, at least to some extent, Again, you are looking at the ingredients for a Fed that has to tighten more. And indeed, those have been the expectations in markets. So you can see uh, the key inter-meeting period there uh, for Fed policy announcements, the July uh, announcement and the September announcements, right around mid-year, right around where the Fed was expected to have peaked already. We now have a significant build in rate hike odds. And so for those two meetings, you're now looking at three point uh, or 5.38, rather, excuse me, um, for uh, July, 5.36 uh, or so for September. That's significantly higher and right in the middle of that five and a quarter to five and a half range uh, for Fed. Uh, for Fed policy where we need to get from the current setting for these numbers to work out. This, of course, on the basis of that data. What has been the result? Well, you can see it right here. The dollar is up close to 4% since the start of this month. Gold is down close to 6%. The S&P 500 is down close to 3%. So the re reaction function here 
is very, very clear. The dollar here is um, the UUP ETF. Gold and the S&P are the relevant futures. ES for uh, S&P, GC for gold. And what you're looking at is, again, this situation where you have a um, very, very clear bias in market um, to say, if the Fed is going to tighten more, number one, risk off. Number two, less appeal for uh, paper currency alternatives, more appeal for the dollar. This, of course, makes complete sense. If you have higher yields, then on the one hand, you have a situation where the dollar is more attractive as um, a yield-bearing instrument. One person's debt is, of course, another person's lending income. So if you're a holder of dollars and the interest rate on borrowing dollars goes up, well, then you can make more money holding it as a lender, as essentially. It is also the case that when there is risk aversion, the markets tend to want to cash out, that is, get out of risky investments that they think are going to do relatively worse in a more challenging economic environment, uh, and uh, move into investments that might do better. There is, of course, the kind of situation that we're faced with here, that the risk aversion follows from the Fed ostensibly setting up to increase the cost of borrowing the essential global currency uh, of, um, of, of, of commerce, the by far preferred medium of, of exchange for uh, international business and transacting in every which thing globally. And that, of course, is an increase in the hurdle rate on economic activity writ large. That is something that impacts virtually everything. And so when you get that kind of a rise, you don't just get um, a sense that the dollar yields more. You also get the sense that economic activity itself has become more expensive to finance. If that's the case, there is a retrenchment on that economic activity. Because now, anybody that might have spent some amount of marginal money or financed some amount of money uh, to go into this or that investment, this or that expansion of a business, even this or that household purchase, they might rethink that now in this kind of environment. Because, of course, the concern is if something goes wrong, and the money is lost, getting it back is now progressively more expensive. So with that in mind, not only do we get a stronger dollar when Fed rate hike odds increase, we also get generally weaker risk sentiment. Markets become more defensive in general. Where do they cash out when they b become defensive like this? Well, certainly the most liquid currency makes sense. That liquidity is going to make that currency more able to absorb a lot of incoming capital flows without moving so much as to inflict losses on investors going up or down. Uh, and it is also the one where policymakers don't actively care that the currency gets stronger. In fact, from the Fed's perspective, although of course the currency is not a part of their mandate, a stronger dollar is a good thing. It's r restrictive on uh, financial conditions, it is counter to the rise in inflation. That's exactly what the Fed wants. And from the, uh, the fiscal policy perspective, the U.S. dollar's strength, first and foremost, enables the U.S. government to borrow, essentially, uh, at lower rates than debt levels would suggest for any other economy because of the ubiquity of the dollar in global commerce. Absolutely nobody that depends on their existing a global commercial system and that depends on it, and that's almost everybody save for perhaps North Korea and increasingly Russia, we have a situation where there's a built-in interest in the dollar not failing.
and therefore, and therefore, a strong dollar that remains a uh, medium of exchange that's viable and that continues to power this system is very much in U.S. interest. Because if the dollar were not that, borrowing terms for um, the U.S. government would be horrendously worse. And so there is understandably a lot more tolerance for a strong dollar than would than would be the case in, let's say, the eurozone, which has a lot of exposure to exports and really doesn't want a euro that's that strong, because that would make its exports that much more expensive to uh, external buyers, which are quite important for big powerhouse engines of European growth, like, say, Germany. So. When we look at the situation, uh, then it makes all the sense in the world in a risk-off scenario to cash out into the dollar of the range of major currencies. So not only does it benefit from the higher yields, it benefits from the risk aversion. Gold, of course, understandably, uh, you can see here, moves inversely of the greenback because gold doesn't yield anything. And so when real interest rates are negative, as they had been, for example, through the COVID uh, period, where what you had was nominal interest rates that were quite low and inflation that was already creeping higher. So uh, on net, real yields were collapsing. Well, then it makes sense to hold gold because something that yields nothing in real terms is a better form of capital preservation than cash, which yields negatively and is essentially leeching money out of your pocket. It's a very different story with the kind of tightening that we've seen now, giving us positive real rates. And of course, the more we extrapolate in that direction, the more that the Fed keeps going, the higher those real rates go. Nominal rates go up, inflation rates go down. That's a higher real rate. And gold's still at zero, which of course makes it completely unattractive in an environment where investors are expecting to have um, speculation continue on a more hawkish Fed. And, and continue that speculation does. This is the latest snapshot of the near-term implied curve. Uh, you can see here we have a peak in rates right around 5.4 at this point, six months forward, so that's about August. As we mentioned just moments ago, there is no policy announcement in August. So what that means is that the peak is somewhere between July and September, as we alluded to just moments ago. But the key thing here is that the curve has shifted considerably higher just over the past 23 days since the end of January. The historical there, the dotted line, is the last day of January. The... Uh, uh, solid line is as of today. So clearly, we have had this shift in policy expectations, and this has been the result. So if we look at where we stand now, it looks like a full rate hike is fully baked in for uh, May. It looks like we have another one fully baked in for March. So those two upcoming meetings, you can see um, that's that implied rate delta. By May, the change relative to where rates are currently is about 56 basis points. So that's a full two hikes, uh, basically, over the next two meetings. By the time we get to July, we can see that implied rate delta is 78 uh, basis points rounded up. So that means that by the middle of the year, we're looking at three 25 basis point rate hikes. You can see the average rate move there, 0 0.25 in the last column on the right. So uh, we have in seeing 77, uh, 78 for July, uh, a full three of these baked in. Now, might we get a 50 in there somewhere along the way? Maybe. But the Fed seems to be content to be moving in, in a 25 basis point increment here this year as they fine tune, which is something that they've been talking about quite a bit. It looks like when we get down 
into December, January, the markets still see the possibility that we are going to give at least one of those away. So when we look at, uh, at, at December, we see 57. When we look at January, we see 43. So between one and two of these rate hikes appear to be set to be given back. Uh, so uh, quick hikes and quick cuts, if expectations are going to hold. That creates a meaningful pocket here to reprice still. Because if the Fed really means it when it says, we are not even thinking about rate cuts in 2023, which is generally the message that, that's been coming out recently, well then, if we get a PCE number that's even a bit warm, if it continues to surprise slightly on the top side, uh, as we noted has been the case uh, recently uh, at the top of the show here, then we're in a situation where there's room to keep this narrative going, to keep extrapolating that the Fed isn't going to have these cuts. And we don't need to go very far. We could shave off, let's say, another 25 basis points from these cuts and end up somewhere uh, at an implied rate delta relative to current levels uh, of somewhere about 50 basis points points, 55. And that would already give us a uh, somewhat more hawkish setting. And if the number is meaningfully higher than that, we could see more. It's important also to recall, as we've talked about here uh, just moments ago, those FOMC minutes suggest the markets picked the direction. And the non-response to US GDP tenuously confirms that idea. So if the PCE number is anything but dramatically dovish in its implication, it might be that the markets just say, oh, well, nothing to see here. This doesn't really change the direction of travel. Back to our regular scheduled readjustment of Fed policy expectations to a more hawkish setting. And that, of course, bodes ill, as we can see here, for shares, for gold, and probably seems to be supportive for the greenback. And that is macro money for today, Thursday, the 23rd of February, 2023. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. You can catch me on this show Monday through a Thursday every week, right after overtime with uh, our good friend Chris Vecchio, head of futures and Forex here at Tasty Live. Outside of those shows, I'm on first call with Tom and Tony on Sunday nights. That's at uh, 4.55 Central Time, 2.55 Pacific here uh, in San Francisco, 5.55 on the East Coast. Uh, and um, outside of those hours, you can catch me on Twitter, opining at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much, everybody. Godspeed. See you next week.